Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Efner and Dale Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. This is your first time tuning in the show. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, free agent frenzy. We're in the midst of it. That much closer to the NFL draft. And there's an old friend that Dan Wolkenstein uses every once in a while. It's called the phone. And when he works the phone, good things tend to happen. And there's no different today. Dan Wolkenstein, if you would, not going to waste any time on this. Do the honors. Man, I'm so excited for this one. Chargers fans are in for a treat. We have Brett Coleman joining us to talk all things Chargers, NFL Draft. We'll talk about free agency frenzy. You've seen him do all kinds of work with the Chargers, covers the NFL as well as the NFL draft process and thousands of prospects and stuff. Um, Brett is one of the best and most innovative minds, in my opinion, and he puts out incredible work. And I cannot wait for Chargers fans to get into this discussion. We talk all things NFL draft. We talk about free agency. We talk about coaching. We talk about best fits. We talk about who the Chargers could possibly take. And he gives predictions for day one, two, and three, who the Chargers will take in the NFL draft. Jake, this is a fantastic one. One of the favorites that we have had to date, in my opinion. Absolutely. But before we get to that, Jake, let's pay the bills. Let's talk about our friends. Want to tell everybody about the easiest way to get into some of these sports action. It is Underdog Fantasy and their Pick'em game. Just pick higher or lower on your favorite or least favorite players. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy-to-use website and mobile apps. Just pick between two and five players to fill out your Pick'em entry. Get every pick right and take home some cold, hard cash. Use the promo code UNLEASHED and get your first deposit doubled up to $500 by Underdog. Head on over to Underdog, Underdog, Underdog Fantasy today and let them know that Chargers Unleashed sent you. Brett Coleman, coming up next on Chargers Unleashed. All right, amidst free agency frenzy in the NFL draft season, we've got a great one today. Uh, you've seen the Film Room episodes all over social media and on YouTube. Does great work covering the Chargers, the rest of the NFL, and NFL draft prospects. Co-host of Bootleg Football Podcast, one of the best and honestly more creative minds in the industry joins us today. Brett Coleman joins us. Brett so excited to chop it up with you today, man. No shortage of Chargers news and storylines coming out of L.A., huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, we kind of knew it was going to be a busy offseason going into it, right? Because they had not no money. They had negative money. And they had a bunch of expensive veterans. And we're like, okay, they're going to have to do something with them. And we're 36 hours in free agency. And we're like, they got to do something with them, guys. What are we doing? <laughs> you know, so we're, we're still waiting for answers. No idea what they're going to do with Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa and, and Mike Williams. Um, you know, obviously, we've seen some former Chargers sign elsewhere uh, so far. Austin, Kenneth, all that. Uh, but we've, we've been kind of waiting for the big moves to happen. Uh, the whole time and i definitely thought they were going to happen before free agency even started and now i just have no idea when and what's going to happen so i'm i'm along for the ride i love it now uh joe hortiz speaking of free agency and we're again we're kind of waiting on pins and needles we're recording this on a tuesday so something might happen between now and when things actually uh go live but Joe Hortiz went out made some moves he went and got a running back a lot of people kind of saw the running on the wall with gus edwards and tight end Will Disley, who is one of the best blockers in the entire NFL. What do you make of the free agency signings so far? And what else do you kind of foresee them going after in free agency specifically? Well, I, you know, the, the tea leaves, not even tea leaves, the scuttlebutt, uh, to use the technical <laughs> term, at the combine was that they were in on Josh Jacobs. And which makes sense, right? Big, strong, back, explosive, all that kind of stuff. You know, all, all the all the traits that Greg Roman loves um, for just like a, a, a lead back that can get a bunch of carries and take punishment and, you know, set the tone, all, the, all that kind of Greg Romany type stuff. Um, and then they got outbid or we think they got outbid by the Packers. And, uh, and that was the point where I was like, okay, now what right now are we looking for, potentially a young back in the draft. We know they hired USC's running backs coach and they got Marshawn Lloyd coming out this year. 
uh, and and he would be a, a great fit for them. You know, maybe Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks. Like, are, are we looking for a rookie here, or is there a lower priced veteran on the market that can, you know, maybe kind of steady the ship for this year, and then they kind of look for youth down the board, and that's of course Gus Edwards. So it made sense from that standpoint. I, I think I think if they got uh, if they got Josh Jacobs, I think their free agency plan would have looked a lot different. And of course their draft plan would have looked a lot different. Now I think with Jacobs in green Bay and Eckler, uh, over at commanders, right. So yes. sign trying to keep track of everything. Uh, then you bring in Gus Edwards. Now I, I do think rookie, uh, you know, potentially a rookie investment is back on the table, not high, because uh, they got other stuff they got to get, but I do think they at least come out of this draft with a, a running back, maybe even multiple, but probably down the board. And Brad, you know this Chargers team inside and out. You've seen their struggles, their opportunities. Brand new coaching staff with Jim Harbaugh at the top, Greg Roman, Jesse Minter rounding it out, leading the offense and the defense. The staff has gotten a ton of praise. And again, we haven't even seen everything come to fruition yet in terms of on-field play. But in your mind, because I know that you've done these type of breakdowns before between offense and defensive schemes and how they could benefit the Chargers, but from Greg Roman and Jesse Minter in particular, what position group, or maybe it's a an overall scheme, do you feel that this team will see the biggest performance and execution boost simply from the coaching alone? Uh, I would say probably interior offensive line. I would say that every single Greg Roman offense going back to, you know, his time with the 49ers in the early 2010s, they always had really, really good interior offensive line play. Uh, and I would say unheralded interior offensive line play. Um, you know, very rarely did you see centers and guards in this system, I think, get the credit they deserve, but they have a lot of work they got to do. You know, whether it's pulling all over the place, you know, blocking in space as pullers, uh, you know, locking in uh, on linebackers, you know, seven, eight yards past the line of scrimmage. And especially the linebackers these days are 220 pounds. They're basically safeties. And so you having a 300 plus pound human that can lock onto them, get to the exact right landmark they need to be, and then actually pick them off in space. That's, that's really hard for, for guards to do. And I feel like Greg Roman always has guards that, that are pretty good at that. So whether it's, it's how they coach it or whether it's how the scheme is designed, um, it just always feels like they have very, very underrated interior offensive line play, and especially guys that can play in space. And then of course the tight ends too, you know, the tight ends have, have a lot of double duty. They got to pull in this system, uh, both in terms of, lining up on the line of scrimmage and digging out edge rushers all by themselves, or again, being guys that have to block in space. Um, you're going to see a lot of what they call escort motion um, where, whether it's tight ends or, or fullback types in this system, you're going to see them basically motion at the snap and kind of get a running start and almost be like the tip of the spear. Uh, and that's also a lot harder to do than you think, because if you're running full speed at the snap and then you're going against a linebacker or a, or a DB or something like that, that can just olay you like you and you're running full speed. It's like, I got to hit this target. I can't overrun it. I can't underrun it. Like, it, again, finding guys that can do that and hit targets on the move at full speed. Uh, it's it's really hard. And I think that's why this this system especially in the ground game always works so well is because when you can find guys that can do that and really nail the choreography, so to speak, and be able to hit targets in space on the move, all of a sudden you get these massive, massive canyons and uh, it makes the running back's job a little bit easier. So uh, you're going to see a, a very different style of run game. Um, but I also think that, that you're going to see um, some, some position groups that maybe aren't, uh, what's the word that aren't uh, heralded be at the forefront of this system. And and I think that's what excite, what excites me about it. What about the let's flip it over? Side? Oh, for Minner. Yeah. Like what's like, what's the oh. group maybe <laughs> that you think will get. <laughs> oh <laughs> I, man. I, I'm trying to leave the car seat the horse here, but like, what is the one <laughs> position or is it everything, but what will be fixed almost single-handedly by coaching alone? 
you know, uh, for for several years now, I feel like if the NFL had a bar fight tournament where it's like every team has to go to a bar and, and get into a fight with another team, we bracket style. Like Chargers are always going to be out in the first couple of rounds. Uh, I will not want to get into a bar fight with the Chargers now with Jesse Minner there because he is going to go out, especially with Ortiz and especially with Harbaugh. He's going to go out and find the most vicious group of psychopaths you have ever seen for this defense. Like completely unhinged, batshit insane psychopaths. That's what this system is built on. Um, my, my favorite scouting terminology, and I can't remember who first used it, but they were looking at the Georgia defense from a few years ago. And they're like, it's just 11 coked up pterodactyls on the field at the same time. <laughs> That's what this team is going to be. Like, I can't wait. You're going to have just these big, strong, obnoxious defensive linemen line of scrimmage and just speed, speed, speed on the second level. It's going to be tree stumps up front, really fast guys on the back end. Uh, they're going to run every single type of coverage. They're never going to major in one thing because they want to be able to run everything. They're going to run a whole bunch of wild – blitzes and simulated pressures they were like 41 percent blitz rate or something like that in michigan last year they didn't need to be they just work because they could like this system is completely insane it is not built for uh, uh for the faint of heart and i can't wait because if there's one thing the chargers desperately need uh it's a little bit of insanity and that's what they're going to get now we're Let's transition to the draft here a little bit. We're just 40 something days now until the NFL draft. And we've talked a ton about how there are so many holes that this team has. You know, we talk about center where currently Jake always says like, nobody's snapping the ball right now. Uh, Linebacker, running back, receiver, like just pick a name out of a hat. That position needs help. If we just take a step back for a second and just kind of focus on like creating the biggest bang for transactions, right? Like, Mm -hmm. What three positions, let's go three, do you feel, whether it's through free agency or the draft, but maybe it's draft, do you feel moves the needle the most in terms of like impacting the team's ability to actually win more football games? What three positions would be there to focus there? Uh, right tackle, boundary corner, center, uh, I would say. And... Uh, center, especially just because in, in this type of system where they're, where they, I think people kind of misunderstand um, what the Greg Roman offense is because they're like, oh, they just run power and counter all day. And it's like, yes, that's true, but they do it in like 10 different kind of ways. And you need a center that can pull. You also need a center that, hey, if we, if, if we run into a team um, where, you know, they they're not running five-man services, they're running four-man services all day, guess what? We're running outside zone 20 times. So we need, we need to have a center that could do that too. That's why they drafted Linderbaum in Baltimore. So not only do they need to be able to do all like the outside zone footwork and stuff like that and be able to reach a, a, a shade by themselves, but also be good at pulling and also be able to dig out a nose by themselves if we're just running duo. Um, so that to me is Jackson Powers Johnson which I know it sounds like I'm describing a unicorn center and you're correct. Like they, sorry, they need one better go get a pro bowl center. guys. <laughs> like you can't That's do this. Six, system too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then boundary corner. And this is something I've, I've been concerned about uh, for a while. Cause if you go back to the, the playoff game, they lost against Jacksonville, uh, the defense completely fell apart once Michael Davis went out. Uh, Cause they didn't have a boundary corner that they could just leave one-on-one. And so then they had to change not only who they had on the field, but they also had to change the coverage structures they could run because they, they didn't have somebody they could leave on an Island. They came back the next year and I was like, okay, well at least Michael Davis is coming back. And then Michael, Davis, he just wasn't, he wasn't himself. Right. Uh, and so it's like, Oh God, they don't have a boundary corner. Like they really just don't have one. So again, even though Minner's going to run every coverage under the sun, like you, you can't do that without having a guy that could just play press man outside. Like you, you literally need one and they don't have one. So that's where I'm looking at like Renardo green top of the second round uh, fits them perfectly. Game. And then, uh, and then of course, top right of the tack- second round. Oh yeah. He's going top 50. Ooh. Yeah, I, I think so. 
I think that's also a big reason why they're linked to Terry and Arnold so heavily, right? Is because like they they know in the building like we don't got anybody. Like we <laughs> need is this the Will Smith Fresh Prince <laughs> yes. meme where he's just like looking around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like oh god, what are we gonna do? We got Devonte Adams coming to town in September. Like yeah, yeah, right. So like that's 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 a real thing for them. They might honestly they need two corners, not just one. Uh, and then right tackle, and I, I've I don't want to say I've been at war with other Chargers fans about this issue. Oh but yeah, I'm it's talking. a thing. They they need one. Like it's it's really important. And offensive line is the only position group that affects every single play, runner pass. So like not quarterback, not running back, not receiver. Offensive line affects every single play, run or pass, no matter the concept. So why? Why would you not make sure that you have the best five possible offensive linemen? You already got the franchise left tackle. Rashawn's not going anywhere. You don't have a good enough right tackle, in my opinion. Like, you just don't. And it's it's nothing against Pip, but, like, they just don't. They need one. They have an opportunity to get one. They should get one. Um, and I think you can you can make do with the day two and day three receivers in this class for sure, especially if you're bringing back Keenan. You don't – want to risk the day two and day three tackle class here like there's a lot of good ones at the top but there is a shelf and the shelf happens a lot later for receiver than it does for tackle so for me i'm not doing the bowers thing at five definitely not doing the bowers thing at five it's either trade down or tackle and even after the trade down i would do tackle i would address corner on day two pick up another receiver later on day two and then hit running back and corner again on day three. And then at that point, you know, it's go to your special teams coaches and be like, who do you want? Who can tackle? And then you, you take a bunch of them on day three. I'm curious, before I transition to the next question about wide receivers, just to piggyback off on that, I think because a lot of the discourse as it relates to the right tackle position, and even I've kind of had this mindset as well, as it relates to Trey Pipkin specifically, because if you go out and you take a tackle at five, whether it be Joe Alt, Fuaga, any of the other t- uh, of the top guys in this class, for Pipkin specifically, because he's in year two of a three-year contract, do you essentially then make him one of the more expensive backup offensive linemen in the league? Or do you eat that $10 million in cap space that you'd essentially be sending him off and then replacing whoever it is that you're drafting with? In that type of situation, what do you think is the right move to do? I would then ask Chargers fans, okay, looking at how much the salary cap just went up, went up by $30 million for a 255. Uh, million on the cap. It, if, are you okay if your swing tackle, which again is going to get playing time, like they're going to put six offensive linemen on the field in this system, especially on early downs? Are you okay with your swing tackle accounting for three and a half percent of your salary cap? Because that's what it would be. Doesn't seem too bad to me. <laughs> like you know, if he if, if Pipkins is your third best tackle, he's your third best tackle. That to me is a good problem to have. And especially if he's going to be on the field, man. So it's like, it's three and a half percent of the cap. Who cares? Like, it's fine. Like, I'm okay with that. Like, they need an answer because I'll tell you what, if he's your only answer and you put him out there and Max Crosby hits Justin in the ribs in week two, and then we're back to where we were a couple years ago, are you going to be okay with the cap savings? Like is is that is that what's priority here, or is it keeping Justin upright? For me, it's keeping Justin upright. <laughs> Brett Coleman selling <laughs> water to Eskimos right now. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, all right, let me transition to the wide receiver class this year because we all expected what they were targeting last year was speed, explosiveness, and just in general. Over the last several years, that's been the biggest factor that this wide receiver group has really lacked. And we know Mike Williams' future as of right now is up in the air. We don't, we don't know if he's going to be traded or released. Um, you know, a, obviously, a contested catch machine was very much a favorite of Justin Herbert's. Offensive separators and contested catch fits for the Los Angeles Chargers. I've heard you mention names like Malik Washington, Cornelius Johnson. Uh, who are some other guys that you're honing in on for the Chargers that fit those archetypes specifically? Uh, I really like Taj Washington from USC to just be like a speed merchant number three. Uh, way underrated. Way underrated in this class. I even talked to a couple of his teammates at USC, and they're like, yeah, Taj is the guy. Like, <laughs> that's that's he's awesome. And, like again, they face him every day, and they know what he can do. And I feel like he didn't really – 
get to highlight his skill set as a separator until he got to the Shrine Bowl. And then you see him in one-on-ones and nobody can touch him. Like nobody touched him at all. Uh, I I yeah. love that kid. I know he's not the biggest one, but like I'm not asking him to be a number one. Like he's going to be the number three. He's going to be um, – honestly, I, I think he would be what Darius was supposed to be. It is just a really fast um, number three that is a legitimate deep threat, great tracker of the deep ball, also better contested catcher than you would think for anybody his size. It's like over 60% contested catch rate. Um, just way, way unheralded in this class. Uh, and then real deep one. This is, again, one of these like late day three picks that we're doing a lottery ticket. Uh, Jalen Coker, Holy Cross. Crazy oh, athlete. Crazy athlete. Uh, the 40, I think, um, I wouldn't pay attention to the 40. I would pay attention to the GPS information. Like, he's fast. He's got speed. And he was also at Shrine Bowl, and he was cooking everybody day one, and then he kind of strained his calf a little bit after the first practice. But nobody could – could handle him either in one on ones. 42 and a half inch vert at, at, you know, six, I think it's six, two, two, ten, something like that. Um, he <laughs> moves. That. I know. He's, he's a crazy <laughs> athlete. Um, he moves very similarly to like Demarius Thomas. I'm not saying he's Demarius Thomas, but I'm saying in terms of movement style, it, it looked very DT to me. And as a freakishly athletic, high upside day three investment at receiver. You could do a lot worse than that, in my opinion. Brett Coleman, just flamethrowers and hidden gems. Uh, we've got a couple more for you, Brett, but I got to say, um, <clears throat> hearing you talk about Te- Tej Washington, man, I do not say this casually, as I have been kind of the leader of the Tank Dell fan support club ever since mm. the draft last year. And... We talk about Justin Herbert eating another dynamic weapon, but he gives me like Tank Dell vibes more than any other prospect in this class. Like clearly not the same ceiling, but Taj Washington totally gives me Tank Dell vibes. And like you said, he creates space that doesn't exist. And he you see so many times where he'll turn no yardage to 10 yards to all of a sudden he's taking it to the house or a five-yard catch turns into going into the end zone every time. Is that comp? Do you see that? Is there anybody else who is like a Tank Dell archetype more so than him this year? In this class? Uh, boy. People said you like know, Xavier that, Worthy. I'm like, I don't see it, dude. I just don't no, see that. No, no, no. I Xavier's so different to me, you know, because I, I feel like Taj is a better route runner. Um, now, he doesn't have the top end speed that Xavier does, or even the first 10 to 15 that Xavier does, because nobody does. Like in the history of the sport, apparently nobody does. <laughs> well, neither did but, Tank Dell. He ran in the yeah, four, 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 five. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I would say just watching, watching how violently that guy runs routes, like when he puts his foot in the ground to change his directions, instant. I would still say Tank was a tick above of that style, but like, even if it's not the same house, it's still the same neighborhood, and you're going to get him in the fourth round, probably. God, give me that. Give me that. You know. <laughs> and and they got other, like I said, they got other stuff they got to address before that. This this whole Chargers taking a receiver early. I don't think they are. Like I really don't. And everybody I've talked to, not in the Chargers organization, but just like around in the general NFL community. Nobody expects them to take a receiver because they all look to the roster and they're like, oh my God, they can't take a receiver. They got other stuff they got to do. So I would imagine the Chargers think of the same thing <laughs> of like, hey man, let's let's get some vegetables on the plate before we do all the meat and potato stuff because <laughs> because they don't have any and they desperately need some. I wanted to talk about best fits for the Chargers on the opposite side of the ball in defense. I know you'd already mentioned green as a potential target him going early on day two but say day one early mid late rounds whatever you want to call it like maybe give us in the first three rounds if the chargers were to go on the defensive side of the ball who would be some of your favorite fits for them on in that respect oh man so i don't think they're gonna do it just because like they already have Asante and I feel like Asante would play the same role, but like uh, Sanders still just fits them so well, just in theory. Um, 
and I, I, I kind of feel like they might pull the trigger on that anyway, just because like he's so good. Um, sticking with Michigan, Chris Jenkins, I think would be. I mean, he was so great in the same system at Michigan as a versatile kind of do it all interior defensive lineman who I think could play five. You could play four I. You could play three. You can give him some snaps at like two I, and I think he'd be just fine there. Like somebody who could just kind of play up and down the front and give your give you a lot of front versatility and also, like I said, complete psychopath, which is what they want. Um, I would say Peyton Wilson from NC State. Yeah, just fast, fast, yeah, to violence. Like he's absolutely their their style. Um, man, this is not really a good year to need a safety. <laughs> that's probably why they signed Alohi back then. <laughs> that's, right. that's probably why. If they do, though, if they do, I think Rabbit Taylor Demerson makes a lot of sense because he's super versatile. And also, he's just their kind of guy for the room. Like, he's a phenomenal person, phenomenal leader. Every, like, if you talk to anybody in the orbit of Texas Tech, like, they would die for that kid. He's awesome. Uh, and also, just a very rangy free safety with ball skills that could also play in the slot, too. Um, I would say as far as boundary corners, if they traded down, I wouldn't hate Quinion oh. mid first, but they'd have to trade down a lot. Yes. Right? A lot? Or even, like, would you take him out like 11? Because people are talking about him being like CB1 now. So if they, let's say they trade down from five, let's, or how, how many, how many, I'll paint you a scenario. And this is a scenario that I, not what I would do, but what I think is going to happen just at this point. Uh, Caleb goes one, Daniels goes two. Again, I would take May, but I think Daniels going two. May goes three, uh, which kind of hurts the Chargers if there's three quarterbacks going off the board. One, two, three. Marv goes four. JJ McCarthy's sitting there at five. They probably go back to 11. I think Minnesota goes up for JJ. And at that point, now you're trying to dangle Bo Nix. You're trying to dangle Michael Penix. Maybe they get somebody to take that bait. But the from problem 11. there, from 11, the problem there, though, is that the two teams that would be taking the bait are in their division. So it's like, do you really want to give the Broncos or the Raiders a quarterback? I'm not sure they do. So they – at this point, 11 might be the furthest back they can go just because I think it's going to be one, two, three quarterback at the start, which is a little bit unfortunate. And at that point, now you're debating Quinion versus Fuaga, and I would just go Fuaga. But no disagreements there. Even though as much as I love Quinion Mitchell, it makes it makes sense in, in that circumstance. I totally get that. Um, you had mentioned Coker from Holy Cross wanted to talk about what you wanted to call them sleepers or just prospects that are just not getting talked about enough. And whether this was things that you heard about or saw at the combine or just in general from your own personal scouting, who are some guys that should really be getting a little bit more glimmer to this whole draft uh, process? Um, well, I mentioned a couple of them. I, I, I really like rabbit Taylor Demerson. I think he, again, he's going to go top hundred for sure. Uh, just because there's not that many good safeties. List. Um, I would say Zach Hines, the tight end from South Dakota State. If you're looking for like a big, like six, seven wide tight end, who apparently also has the best hands on the team, according to his teammates. Uh, so he's somebody who I think, you know, could go in like the Colby Parkinson range. If you remember him, similar kind of six, seven tight end out of Stanford, went to the Seahawks in like the sixth round, somewhere around there. And that was like four years ago. Um, I would say. <sighs> For running back, I'm kind of going, man, running back is so thin. Isaac Arendo from Louisville, which I had highlighted him back in January, and then, of course, he went and absolutely dominated the combine, so he's not really a, a secret anymore. Uh, at tackle, boy, are there any tackles I think could even – that I'd feel comfortable with on day three? I'm not sure if there are. Maybe like Aneem Donkwa. What any was centers? that? centers? Because oh, if you're going, if you're going alt at, going alt oh. at one, and you're doing one or two wide receiver three, whatever, like you're still. Uh, there's, the there's a, the good thing is there's a million centers in this class. Uh, Hunter Nazat from Penn State. Hallelujah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Penn, Penn the <laughs> shocker. Penn State is a freak athlete center coming out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they feed their kids there, but it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, 
I would say Christian Boyd from Northern Iowa absolutely fits the bill for Minner's defense as well as a versatile interior defensive lineman. He's bigger than Jenkins. He, he's going to come in at like 317, 320. So he could play shade or 2i or 3, but I think he's he's going to be a little bit closer to the ball than Jenkins would be, but I love him. He's going to go fourth round at the latest, in my opinion. Some people are saying fifth, and I'm like, I don't know, man, not in this defensive tackle class. Like, there's a lot of three techniques, but there's not a lot of guys that would play further inside than that, and he's one of them. Uh, and then depending on what happens with edge, which we still don't have any clarity on that for what's happening with Joey and what's happening with Khalil, there are some down-the-board edges that uh, that I think could work here. Um, Mo Camara, Colorado State. He'd be great. Uh, again, oh. extremely tenacious. Already talks like a five, six year vet. Like when we were talking to him at Shrine Bowl, I asked him some questions about how, you know, before the snap on a few plays, I saw him kind of resetting his feet and and switching what was his lead foot and what was his back foot. And I kind of asked him about it. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's just depending on the type of sets that I'm reading from the tackle. And I want to be able to hit the move that I want to hit off the right foot. And so I'm counting. And, I'm, and he's, he kind of walked me through his whole process of deciding how, how he gets into his stance based on the sets that he's reading. And I'm like, oh, you're just 28 already. OK, good to know. <laughs> So he's he's awesome. I I love Mo Camara. There's a reason he was second in all of college football in pressures, and it's because he just gets pass rushing. So he's another one who's going to go probably third, fourth round. That's that's also part of the reason why I want the Chargers to trade back is just get a bunch of these third, fourth round picks because they need them really, really badly. And there's how many guys I just listed off are going to go between picks hundred and one twenty that they, they could use all of them. So totally. Uh, Brett, you have been so gracious with your time and you've been fantastic. And for folks who have not seen your work, like they're living under a rock one, two, they're going to love it. You do a ton. Let's get you out of here with this. We do this for, with everyone who covers the NFL as we get towards draft season, you get to put on your Nostradamus hat, Beth Stradamus. will coin that one for a bit. Day one, Day two, day three prediction for the Chargers. Give us one player that you predict will be a Charger. We'll go day one, then pick anyone from day two, and anyone from day three. The floor is yours. Day one, Talia Sifuaga at 11 after a trade down. I'll really shoot my shot on that one. Uh, <laughs> you need to specify, three. though, because people I may did. think you may be talking about five. So. <laughs> Well, oh, I've, I've I've just been dodging pitchforks the entire time because I didn't just say Brock Bowers. Um, so I'll say Fuaga at eleven. Day two. Oh man, is it Coram or Lloyd? Coram or Lloyd? Oh, I'm I'm gonna say Marshawn Lloyd just because I think he's a better player. But I know Jim, it, like you're going to have to be restraining him from the phone when Corum's on the board. Maybe they'll get both. Who knows? Um, trade back, day, get another third round. There you go. Trade back, get all of them. <laughs> and then day three. Ooh, what's a what's a wild one? What's a wild one we could do? Man, um, if they got Taj Washington. This is your floor. But if they got Taj Washington, I'm doing backflips. I would love that for them. But also, you know, we're Chargers fans here. We're not allowed to have nice things. So I'll go with uh, Kyrie Jackson from Oregon. Okay. He's a very corner. corner. He's a very, very, athletic athletic corner. very athletic guy. Love that. Love that player. Oh, man. Well, it, uh, you heard it here first. Really good draft, by the way. Like, I do think the Chargers are going to draft well. But they they have to trade back. Ah. Uh. We're hoping for the the holy grail, as Brett calls it, with a double trade back. Uh, but hey, we're not picky. We'll take one. It's fine. Brett, you are the man. Um, what are some of the things you're working on coming up? Where can folks find your work? Uh, so tomorrow. Well, I don't know when when when's this going up. Is this going up today or today? Or, uh, we're trying to get it today, yeah. just so we can get it out. Well, speaking of day two receivers, uh, I have a Malachi Corley episode uh, going up tomorrow. Uh, which I actually I I kind of feel like Corley might actually fit what the Chargers are going to try to do uh, pretty well. Just because if there's one thing Greg Roman loves, it's uh, making things into running backs that aren't running backs. And I feel like Corley could be like the jet sweep guy uh, in, in this system. 
so that's going up tomorrow. And then uh, I'm, I'm hitting some edge rushers after that. I got a Jared Verse episode coming out. Uh, and then, uh, you know, let's see, with uh, Latu, Latu, Latu from yes. UCLA coming next week. So uh, not that I think the Chargers are in the market for an edge as of right now, but within 24 hours, they might be. <laughs> so we'll see. But either way, lots of stuff to watch soon. I love it. Brett, you can find him at Brett Coleman on X. Obviously, he does the film room stuff as well as the bootleg football podcast. Brett, you are the man. Thank you so much for coming on the show with us. You were gold. Uh, Appreciate you coming on. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Thank you for having me. Thanks, Brett.